Good evening. Merry Christmas. It is wonderful to see everybody here. I know that it is a humble crowd, uh, not just in number, but also in spirit. And that is appropriate for this evening on what we are going to honor and to celebrate. Uh, I know that if, if you are uh, joining us, you enjoyed the Christmas musicale. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, Donna. And it is disappointing because our choir had prepared uh, really uh, the just amazing pieces and it's the best you've ever sounded, but you're not going to be able to know that because we weren't able to sing tonight. Um, but thank you for embarking on that, Donna. And I'm confident that we will come together and sing very soon. Since we have these Christmas carols under our belt, I wouldn't mind celebrating Christmas at the end of January, in the middle of February, who knows when. Right. That's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Why not? Uh, you know, <clears throat> that's what's tough uh, right now, is that there's obviously a very concerning amount of uh, people who are in the hospital right now with the respiratory illnesses uh, of various kinds. It's been a really hard couple of years. I didn't think that we'd be back in this position again uh, this year, but it's okay. It's okay because everyone's here, and it's okay because God is not only on the throne, but God came here to be with us, and in the most humble of circumstances, and that's what we are going to celebrate tonight. If you look on the inside of your bulletin, you will notice our announcements and also the beautiful poinsettias that decorate the front of the sanctuary. They're given in honor and in memory of various peoples. During communion, you are invited to come forward down the center aisle and take one of the cups and return to your seat. That is why the communion table is down on the floor this evening. And we will not be singing our hymns this evening together, uh, but we will be listening. And I'll be honest, it's, it's a bummer. I want, I want to sing. I've enjoyed singing again these past a few Sundays, but I'm confident that this will pass uh, pretty quickly. And in reality, I think that it is fitting on this night all of our hymns will have that same peaceful, contemplative nature that Silent Night always does. Ye faithful will still come, even though with a little less bravado, maybe. And we will still hear from the angels on high because we will be listening. And we will humble ourselves to God's glory in the highest without the addition of our voice. And God's glory will still come to us as we are bathed in the beauty of a humble heaven descending upon the chaos of this earth, giving us peace and assurance in our hearts. To begin our worship service this evening, I invite the Hart family forward to lead us in our Advent candle wreath lighting. This evening, remember to light all the candles. This evening we celebrate the arrival of our Lord. When God came to us, when God came to be with us, Emmanuel. In Psalm 130, verse 5, it is written, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. So God's love began as a flicker of hope, shining in the darkness. As that hope burned on, God's peace would not be overwhelmed by the chaos that threatened to destroy life. It is as, as it is written in Isaiah 
26, verse 12, Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. That hope and peace allowed us to enjoy the moment that God has given us now a moment of great expectation, anticipation, and excitement. It is written in the 162nd verse of Psalm 119, I rejoice in your promise like the one who finds great spoil. And this joy is deepened with God's deep love, the only thing that truly is everlasting. The refrain from Psalm 136 repeats this truth, God's love endures forever. Now this evening, we light the Christ candle, representing the light of God come to this world. As foretold by the prophet Isaiah, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 2, the people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a new light has dawned. I'd ask that you now please join me in our responsive reading to open our worship from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that hath been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. We now come together to celebrate God's everlasting light. And we come and comes to us in song. But as Alex has said, unfortunately, Due to our current circumstances, we will not be singing. But I ask that you please open your hymnals and sing these songs to yourselves in silence, meditating while Linda plays these beautiful pieces.
the deal. <laughs> it's hard to help. But now is the time in this evening's service where we give up those ways that we may have stumbled or the guilt that we might have on our hearts. And we give it to the Lord. And I invite you now to join with me in our prayer of confession, found printed in our bulletin, if you are so willing, as we share in this prayer in some common ways that we might have fallen short of God's expectation and glory. I invite you to join me. Lord Heavenly Father, tonight we come together to celebrate the birth of your Son in the light of your favor. We celebrate peace and the hope that we have in such peace. Yet as we do so, we admit there are too many times when we have not contributed to your peace. Too many times we have turned others away who are needy and seeking shelter. Too many times we have been so focused on our own celebration that we don't honor or celebrate your arrival through spiritual renewal and sharing your grace. Forgive us of the ways we stumble and guide our steps towards your amazing grace, your steadfast love and beautiful purpose. We now confess our most personal sin to you alone and silence. tough things about Christmas as we celebrate new life and the birth of new life is that we know how this life would end. We know that this beautiful life was cut short before its time on our account. And that is why we also have life and hope forevermore. And I want us to always remember that, particularly on this evening. And now I invite you to join with me in singing to God's loyal presence and faith using the glory of Patri. Because the greatest sign of Christmas 
is the sign of life. And remember how precious and wonderful your life is in God each and every day, especially tomorrow morning. Remember God first. Please join with me in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your gift. The gift of your presence, of your teaching, of your wisdom, and your life given for us. It is in your name we pray. Amen. In the book of Isaiah, it is written of the coming Messiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. As Christians who see our God of love and compassion and mercy, we might forget exactly what it means when the prophets speak of the fear of the Lord. It is the holy reverence, awesome power, and steadfast desire for justice that comes with such mercy and compassion. It is a stance of humility, respect, reverence, and honor. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, plant the seed of faith in those of us who have not yet heard your story, and grow the faith of those who have received you. Open our hearts again to your story of old that comes to us anew, a story of what has come to pass and our hope in what is still to come. Amen. First scripture lesson comes from Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 16. It comes at the beginning of Isaiah's prophecy. The Lord addresses King Ahaz, the corrupt king of the southern kingdom of Judah, as the Lord shares news of a prophecy regarding the northern kingdom of Israel and the empire of Syria over 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson is the story of the birth of Christ from Luke's account, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Hear the good news. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their hometown to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in, this, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. you 
you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bill. For this meditation, please pray. Lord, may your story settle upon our hearts, your peace upon our lives. And Lord, strengthen us with your faith and your light that shines in the darkness, guiding us along your path. It's your name we pray. Amen. So, here we are, again, kind of half-gathered, some over Zoom, hello, some here, and it seems like we're still taking a while to get back to things. And it seems like every time there is more hope, there's always more bad news that spreads, and that's not the only thing that spreads. And I don't know why, it just, we can't be left in peace. But that's the reality of things. And that is why tonight more than ever we need to remember this sign that God had promised. Now, Bill read it this morning, he started off with a prophecy that comes from a time of Israel's history that was quite tumultuous in its own right. And actually, that could count as most of Israel's history. There was only a few snapshots of great peace. But in this uh, prophecy, it was presented to a man named King Ahaz. He reigned about 2,750 years ago, about 730 years before the events of the story we remember tonight. And he was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. He was not a prophet, but the Lord spoke to him nonetheless, and God said this, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. And for some reason, he responded piously, I will not put the Lord to the test. And that is when Isaiah, or Isaiah incredulously asked, you're already trying the patience of men. Will you not try the patience of God also? And I have no idea why a king would respond to God in this manner. I don't know how God exactly was speaking to, uh, Isaac, or to Ahaz. I don't know if he sounded mocking. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. I, I don't know how this information was presented, but Ahaz was not having it. He thought that this would test God. And God said a sign would be presented anyways. And it's a very odd sign for a God whose wrath was being kindled consistently at this time. As God was pushed aside. It's a very weird sign. The sign that God would give would not be one that would seem to foretell wanted destruction because it was not a sign of death. It was a sign of miraculous life. God told Ahaz this, a virgin will give birth and he will be called Emmanuel. God is with us. 
And as the prophecy relates, he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. And before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. There is a very involved history and prophecy that follows here. And needless to say, in Israel's history, this prophecy directly related to the nation of Israel and to the exile and to the darkness and to, to the terrible times that lay right in front of them over the period of the next 200 years. And that is how the story has been interpreted by Israel. But in our story tonight, we see that sign come to pass much later in a much different way. And as we know, God's time is different than our time, and this promise will have to wait another 700 years to come to pass. And our story is not centered on a nation or a kingdom that has yet come to be. This story is one that ends up being far bigger. And it starts out much, much smaller. Because every sign of life starts out small. Think about it. When do you most often hear this phrase? We're searching for a sign of life. Or we see a sign of life. Where do we hear that? Please correct me after the service, but the times that I've heard that are A, most often in a television show, when someone looks like they're dead. Or, if there is a new planet that looks thoroughly lifeless. You're searching for a sign of life. And in this sign, you're yearning that this life can continue, that there is something here. Because if you're saying, I need a sign of life, I want to find a sign of life, That means it's hard to find. And usually a fervent prayer is involved. Um, but if there's a sign of life, that also means that there is hope. And the world was in bad swords when there was found a sign of life. The sign was small, it was faint, and it was filled with hope and love. There was a sign of life, and it was both humble in birth and hopeful in circumstance. And this was how God came to the world, with a sign of life. And now is a good time to pay attention to the circumstance that God comes into the world. Because the man who would be God's son was someone who was thoroughly humbled by circumstance. Even in this story of his arrival on earth, God was humbled by conditions that were far out of his son's control. That almost doesn't even make sense. How is this out of anyone's control? This arrival wasn't met with great pageantry. It wasn't in a king's court. It wasn't like Jesus exhibited superpowers like the baby from Incredibles 2 who could turn into a fireball and destroy enemies. Jesus was just a baby. There wasn't any sign that he would necessarily become what he became other than a promise from an angel, which admittedly is a pretty big deal. But it's something that still needed to be trusted. And the people who heard this news were not the wealthiest of the wealthy or the highest of the high. It certainly wasn't the King Herod, or shouldn't have been, but it ended up happening. 
was shepherds nearby. And these circumstances were ones that the Holy Family had to deal with. These circumstances were ones that could not be changed. And it would, be do, it would do us good to remember that as we seek the light in the darkness. But as we know, even the smallest light pierces through the darkness, especially when the darkness is deep. And eventually this child and this light would grow to consume the world, and this child would grow to fulfill the promise made just a few chapters later in Isaiah 9, 6-7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. But we aren't there yet. We have to remember that that zeal has to start somewhere. So, it started in a manger, in a town without a room and with shepherds and animals and a few humans. Not a great many. And where do we go from there? Once we have this sign of life and that hope, what do we do next? We pray that it strengthens and grows. We pray that this sign of life grows strong and then we get to see more of the story unwrapped. And when we start with this sign of life, we might know that there is a long road ahead. We know that this might take a while, and we know that we will have to rely on God's grace to get us through. But the good news is this. All good news starts with that sign of life. And we would do well to remember on this quiet evening precious importance of seeing a sign of life. Our minds are pulled to the dull existence of shepherds who tend to their flocks, to an overwhelmed family burdened with the greatest of responsibilities, reliant on the unknown plan of God with help in whatever form it might come, just looking for a place to rest to the story where amidst all of this, the peace of God prevails. And amidst all this, the light of humankind was born in the darkness. It was the sign that came when almost nobody was looking. It was a sign prepared for shepherds and a small group of mysterious strangers from afar. It was a sign that would endure and carry us through the circumstance that we are still faced with today tonight. But tonight we enjoy the peace, assurance, and the hope of God present in that sign of life. The sign of a great life to come and life that will last forevermore. Think about these things and treasure them and ponder them in your heart just as Mary did as we listen to hymn number 192. Angels we have heard on high.
Now, a short time after Jesus was born, some strangers showed up and they were bearing gifts, which was an odd but a very welcome sight. And at this time, I would like us to give to God what might be on our hearts, whatever gift that might be on your heart. And that could be gold, <laughs> and it could be other gifts of meaning, of service. And uh, let us think about that. And if you have offerings or prayers to give, uh, you may come forward through the aisle and present them in the offering plate as we listen to Linda play. Now that I've invited everyone to process and uh, give their gifts, we're going to do it again. <laughs> this time uh, we are going to uh, receive the communion elements. And if you are unable to uh, process forward, uh, we can have a server bring you the elements. But everyone who has a desire to follow Christ, to know Christ, and to share in his life and ministry is welcome and invited to the table this evening. And we will process down two lines, and please take a cup and return to your seats. And I will uh, break the bread afterwards, but now as you come forward, uh, we will listen to uh, Linda play. <laughs> Thank 
before we share in this holy meal, I invite you now to join with me in prayer. Lord in heaven, we pray for the safety of all those gathered here tonight. But first and foremost, that we pray we do your will, no matter what the risks. Lord, we pray that you lead us to love one another and love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Lord, we give you thanks for the great gift of your story and your presence on this evening, a gift that will spread across the world. And Lord, now amidst these trying times, we come together to pray these words that your Son taught us to pray. Pray now, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his betrayal, many years after this moment we celebrate tonight, 33 years later to be exact, Jesus reclined at the table with his disciples. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to share this Passover meal with you. For truly I tell you, I will not partake of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Giving thanks, he took the cup and he said, Take this cup and divide it amongst yourselves. For truly I tell you, I will not again partake of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. In a like manner, taking the bread, he said, take, this is my body given for you. The body of Christ given for us. Taking the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured for you. And every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember Christ's death until he comes again. Now is the time in our service where we remember the peace of Christ. And we not only remember Christ's death, but first we remember his birth. And I invite us to listen to Silent Night, to read the verses printed in your bulletin. And as we do so, we will pass the light of Christ down the aisle. Uh, Ron, you will pass the light to, to each first person down each aisle. As you pass the light to your neighbor, don't tip the light. Tip the part, the candle itself that is not lit. And then hold it upright. So that your neighbor can light it. As we listen to Linda play this hymn, 
and share the light of Christ around the world. Be deep in prayer and let God's peace settle on your hearts. Thank you.